Today we're beginning our new series looking at the book of Joshua. The plan is to go through the first part of the book in some detail, then in the last week to skip to the end to find out how things ended for Joshua. It's probably helpful to begin by working out exactly where we are in the story of God's people at the beginning of Joshua. To do that, I'm going to go back a bit um, and plot some of the events that happened before this book Um, onto the image, that the timeline from the Bible course. You might remember that in the book of Genesis, God had called Abraham and promised to make him a great nation. God told him that he would be given the land of Canaan. Genesis continues to tell the story of Abraham and his descendants. By the end of the book, Joseph and his family were living in Egypt Right at the end of Genesis, we read some of his final words. In Genesis 50, verse 24, it says, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But that doesn't happen immediately. The book of Exodus begins with the Israelites in Egypt doing really well, but perhaps a bit too well for the new king who makes them into slaves. That is until God calls Moses to lead the people to freedom. You might remember him going to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go, the ten plagues and all those things. Ultimately, Moses did lead the people out of Egypt. They celebrated the first Passover and fled across the River Nile. A miracle made sure that they could get across before Pharaoh's army could catch them. The waters parted and the people crossed on dry land. Then the waters came back and swallowed up the Egyptian army. Once they were out of Egypt, Moses met with God and received the law. Instructions on how the community was to live. A way of living that would set God's people apart from the other tribes and nations. Eventually, the people were led near to the land of Canaan. The land that God had promised to Abraham. In Numbers chapter 13, Moses sends out 12 spies to check out the land. Ten of them report back negatively. Only Joshua and Caleb believe that they should take the land. Because of that negative report, the people become disheartened. They're on the verge of appointing a new leader to replace Moses and take them back to Egypt. In the end, this disobedience to God cost them dearly. God says that they're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness and no one aged 20 or above would set foot in the land. They'd all die in the desert. And that's what happens. The book of Deuteronomy that comes immediately before Joshua ends with the death of Moses. He sees the land, but he never makes it in. Instead, we're told that Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. That's kind of how things are left when we reach the end of the first five books of the Bible. Those five books that make up the Pentateuch, what we often call the books of law. And Joshua is the next book. In many ways, it picks up the story. But it also acts as a transition into the group of books that we often describe as history. The law has been given. Joshua and the books that follow are more concerned with how God's people try to live out that law in the land and the new situations that they encounter. But the book makes constant reference to what has gone before. Events in Deuteronomy and Numbers 
are never very far away in Joshua. The book of Joshua itself is divided into kind of three parts, really. The first 12 chapters cover entering and taking the land. That's where we're going to spend most of our time in this series. Chapters 13 to 21 are about allocating the land to the various tribes of Israel. Chapters 22 to 24 are about preparing to live future life in the land. So, let's read Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you, and I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your supplies ready. Three days from now you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land The Lord your God is giving you for your own. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the command that Moses the servant of the Lord gave you. The Lord your God is giving you rest and has granted you this land. Your wives and your children and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan. But all your fighting men, fully armed, must cross over ahead of your brothers. You are to help your brothers until the Lord gives them rest, as he has done for you, and until they too have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of the Jordan, towards the sunrise. Then they answered Joshua, Whatever you have commanded us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey your words, whatever you may command them will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. One of the things that we're hoping through this series is that spending time in one book will help us to become confident in knowing and applying the Bible. One of the points in our vision. I've spent some time giving some background knowledge that will hopefully be useful as we go through the book. So now I'd like to offer some thoughts about how we might apply some of this um, passage from chapter 1 of Joshua. How we might apply that today. And as I was thinking and praying about the passage, there were four things that really stood out to me that might resonate with us today. Of course, there may be other things that you've picked up on, and I encourage you to um, pray through those. But perhaps one of these four things might particularly speak to you. The first is that God called Joshua. 
Moses, the great prophet and leader of the people, the one who spoke with God on their behalf, was dead. Someone was going to have to take on responsibility for leading God's people. We've already heard how the book of Deuteronomy described Joshua as full of the spirit of wisdom. The people seemed to trust him to begin, to to continue what Moses had begun. Now, in this passage, God speaks to him directly and appoints him as the leader. God continues to call people today. In fact, if you were here over the summer, you might have heard how Jesus called his first disciples. He invited them to become fishers of people. He invited them to follow him. He invited them to discover life in God's kingdom. That's an invitation that he continues to offer us today. Come, follow me. Discover what life with God is like. There's this general invitation to become a disciple of Jesus. But God often calls us to specific things as well. Perhaps as we read about God's call to Joshua, we might reflect on our own sense of calling. What specific things might God be asking of us right now? Is there something that we know we should be doing that we're putting off? For me at the moment, I feel like God is challenging me to step out more in evangelism, to take more risks in sharing the good news of Jesus. Of course, in my role here, I often meet with people and they kind of expect me to talk about God and Jesus and the things of God. But I'm talking more about in my everyday being. We've just had new neighbours move in next door and so far the only thing we've really spoken about is which day to put out the bins. It would be nice to find an opportunity to share something about life with God with them. The second thing that stood out from this passage was that Joshua's calling was built on God's promises. In verse 3, God says, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. In verse 5, he promises to be with Joshua like he was with Moses. Joshua had seen how God was with Moses. It must have been really encouraging to him to hear that God would be with him. The Bible is full of God's promises. The Gospel of Matthew ends with a promise from Jesus to be with us always to the very end of the age. As we try to live as disciples today, Jesus promises to be with us. As we'll see as we go through Joshua, God keeps his promises. And we sing that sometimes. He's way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, Light in the darkness. That promise of Jesus to be with us by his spirit is one that I'm going to be clinging to if I'm brave enough to take the risks that I feel I'm being challenged to take at the moment in respect of evangelism. I wonder what promises of God are you clinging to at the moment? What do you long to see fulfilled? The third thing was that Joshua was told to meditate on God's word. In verse 8, he's told that the book of law must never leave his lips. He's to meditate on it night and day, so that he and the people will live as God is calling them to live. It was obviously important that Joshua knew God's law, But this goes much deeper than just knowing what God commands. He's being encouraged to chew it over, to consider what it means for him and the people as they learn to live in this new place. Joshua isn't necessarily going to find a neat commandment that covers every um, situation that they encounter. Next week, we'll read about Joshua sending spies into the land to check it out. When Moses sent spies in numbers, we're told that it was God who told him to do it. In Joshua, 
there's no recorded instruction from God. At least we're not told about it if there is one. Instead, this seems to be a wise, spirit-filled person reflecting on what God has done before, understanding what God requires and making decisions in the moment based on that. Meditating on God's word, being familiar with God's story and praying through it helps us to navigate life today. It's hearing the stories of Jesus in Galilee over the summer that's probably sparked this sense that I ought to be talking more about Jesus with people that I meet. It's come out of encountering those stories afresh in a different way over the summer. It's come out of praying with those stories. And the fourth thing that stood out to me from this passage was this instruction to be strong and courageous. In all honesty, I probably could have spent the whole time speaking about being strong and courageous. It's a verse that often ends up on fridge magnets and mugs, um, tea towels, pictures, you name it. God tells Joshua to be strong and courageous three times, I think. And after he's instructed the officers of the people, they tell him to be strong and courageous too. When you think that you've heard God say something, it's always helpful if someone else comes along and seems to say exactly the same thing. It can sort of confirm it for you. I sense that that may have happened to Joshua here. But actually being strong and courageous flows out of the three things that have gone before. Joshua knew that he was called by God. He knew the promises of God. And he was meditating and rooted in God's word. It's those three things that would enable him to be strong and courageous. Joshua was no great military leader, but he was going to be in charge of a significant operation to take the land. To be honest, without those firm foundations, I'm not sure whether he would have even tried it. But knowing God's call, knowing God's promises, knowing God's word provided him with the assurance and boldness that he needed. If we're going to live as faithful disciples today, we need to be strong and courageous too. There are times when we need to go against what our culture regards as normal and challenge it. There are times when we might have to get over our own fears and embrace new things as we learn to share the good news in new ways, in a new generation. We need God's strength and courage in both. My prayer for us today is that we would know that strength and that courage that comes from knowing that we're called by God, by knowing the promises of God, and being deeply rooted in God's word. I pray that as we continue to go through this book of Joshua, we find ways to um, apply what we're reading to our lives today. In Jesus' name, Amen.